Hola, Econ peeps. Um, so today is a, kind of a special lecture, so bear with me here. Let's take a look at our schedule real quick so you can kind of see. Um, this is where we are. Uh, I am filming this uh, about three weeks before it's due for you to watch, So, uh, but it should be posted uh, well before that. Uh, but And again, it is for a grade, um, but it is not something that is uh, in the textbook. Um, for this, so about, I guess it was about 2016, I attended a uh, um, a seminar uh, at the SMU Cox uh, Business Center, I think it was called, um, on the campus of Southern Methodist um, and uh, around Dallas, right? So um, the event was sponsored, at least in part, by uh, an organization called the Libra Institute, um, a my understanding is they basically um, preach the merits of free markets to a largely Hispanic audience. Um, that's their focus. Um, the gentleman who uh, heads it up, I believe his name is Daniel Garza, um, was the keynote speaker. Uh, I had the privilege of sitting at his table just coincidentally when I walked in. I sat down and it happened to be the table he was sitting at. And then, of course, he got up and gave his keynote presentation and we all ate. And it was, uh, it was, he was a very interesting guy. Um, uh, so uh, um, if you're interested in, in uh, learning more about the Libra Institute, I would uh, urge you to Google that and you can find out some more information. All right. <clears throat> so um, the argument I'm going to try to make here is that um, the cost of living has not only not gone up, but it has fallen, and fallen rather dramatically. Um and I'm going to try to make this argument. But before I do, we need to kind of lay some groundwork uh, about, uh, you know, just kind of the general uh, workings of the economy, as we've learned so far, right? So uh, this, there were four different presentations at this seminar, and I basically put two of them together uh, to, to make this presentation, all right? So uh, the first thing that we should talk about is... The fact that uh, the jobs picture is not necessarily as rosy as people are saying it is. And I think we'll find that out. Uh, there was a recent uh, report by a liberal think tank called the Brookings Institute. Uh, I just found this today. Um, September 9th uh, is when I saw this report um, or a news report about the report in which um, an Obama administration official said that they expect... Uh, uh, a lot of layoffs in the next two years, and they expect the unemployment rate to rise over six, maybe close to seven percent. We'll see. Uh, I'm not at all surprised by this. I've been saying this is what's coming. There's no way around it if we want to get inflation under control. We will talk about that more uh, on another day, but suffice it to say that we could be in some pretty turbulent times. This was referring to the jobs picture in 2016, but you know, despite it having significantly improved since then, it has it is back certainly headed into some pretty um, uh, turbulent waters. Let's say, okay. So let's look at some headlines that kind of capture get a snapshot of this, right? Uh, Yahoo's going to cut 15% of their workforce. Verizon uh, reports loss uh, plans to cut more jobs. That was in 2010, right? Monsanto swung to a, a loss in the first fiscal quarter, announces a thousand more job cuts. Sprint slashes 2,500. Chrysler has shed 10,000 jobs. Uh, here's a report from 2010. The economy is still bleeding jobs. By the way, that was the year I graduated from college, 2010. Um, I was 50, 42 years old at the time, um, and I'm graduating with a degree in economics, smack dab in the middle of one of the worst uh, economic situations I think college graduates have faced for a long time. It's one of the reasons why I went to education. It's because I, I was having a hard time with anything else, but I could certainly, uh, you know, they always need math teachers. <laughs> so I became a math teacher, and I worked my way through grad school as a high school math teacher. But, again, you can see uh, uh, 85,000 uh, cuts, uh, lost in jobs, right? Uh, job cuts loom, stimulus fades, long-time workers struggle with long-term joblessness, all right? So, um but if you can, it, that was 2010. Those are likely going to be fairly similar headlines you're going to see over the next two years. Keep looking for them. If you're actively looking, I bet you're going to see some of these, right? But the real question is, 
is that any different than what what we see in the next couple of years? Is that different from what it was back in 2010? Is it different than what it was um, in the 90s when the economy was just cruising? Well, um, here's a, uh, a report from 1995. MCI slashes 3,000 jobs, right? Quaker cut 1,200. Burlington, 500. Compact, 8,000 jobs, right? Uh, Intel, Delta, Halliburton, EDS, all cutting jobs. Arco, First Plus, Oryx, Chevron, IBM, Lockheed Martin, Nortel, Burlington Northam, DuPont, Nabisco, Kilgore, Otis, Convex, Halliburton, First Plus, Mobile, Greyhound, um, Crandall, uh, Merrill Lynch, AT&T, Procter & Gamble, Citigroup, Alcoa, GTE, Delta, Xerox, SBC, Heinz. The list goes on and on and on um, throughout the 90s when the economy was just buzzing right along um, in economics we call the period from roughly the mid 80s to 2008 that roughly 20 plus year period we call that the great moderation partly because quite frankly it was pretty boring to study the economy during that time we had we, we seemed to be managing it rather, rather well felt like we'd really tamed those animal spirits as they say that's the hubris of economists I can assure you but uh, it, it doesn't end, right, they, these, these layoffs. So the question is, do those layoffs, do those job cuts, is that really evidence that the economy is faltering or failing? Not necessarily. There was a time where we got around like this on horses, horseback and buggies, right? Um, uh, here's a, a whole stagecoach, right? We also got around by train. All right, uh, that's a, that's a mode that's not as popular today as it used to be by any stretch, and we'll see details on that. We traveled uh, across uh, the globe in steamboats, right? So during those times, you had carriage makers and blacksmiths and teamsters, engineers, conductors, boiler makers, all those jobs. We kind of lost a lot of those as a result of technology, right? We got better transportation, arguably, right? There's a 1912 Model T. Ain't that a beaut? How'd you like to be driving that? Better hope for good weather, huh? And that, of course, led us to create the interstate highway system, right? And then the Wright brothers in what was it, 1903? Heavier than air flight, once thought impossible. Within three decades of this occurrence, commercial airline travel was pretty standard around the world. Five decades, by the 50s, it was everywhere, right? And so all the jobs of these blacksmiths and uh, uh, buggy whip makers, uh, all the folks working on the railroad, did you know in 1920, there were over 2 million people working for the railroad? That's one out of every 15 people. All right. 2 million people in 1920. Remember that number. 2 million, 1920. That accounted for one out of every 15 people working. All right. And that's what the picture looks like today going into the 2000s. 20 years ago, you can see that it had dropped below 300,000. You could also talk about this in terms of uh, operators. My, for example, when I was stationed in Germany back in the late '80s, um, I used to have to call the operator to collect the, to connect uh, to my parents' house, uh, collect call. They would have to accept it, and they would be charged. They were uh, hopefully uh, more than happy to take to make the to pay the phone bill to have the opportunity to visit with me briefly on the phone. And of course, the time difference, you know, Germany's like seven hours um, ahead of us or something like that. So it was a bit of a pain. Um, but nonetheless, I would call periodically, right? Um, and I would have to call an operator and say, I need to make a collect call to Texas with my little Texas twang. Uh, it was a little strange sometimes, right? Uh, how about the typing pool? That was pretty common practice not so long ago. Uh, agriculture. Agriculture was a huge business. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Does anybody know what's, what's down here in the lower right-hand corner? Those are elevator porters. Um, back then, 
if you need to go uh, upstairs, you'd step in there and tell them, and they would uh, activate the elevator and send you on your way. All right. So here's agriculture. Huge business. Huge business. In 1910, 11 and a half million people worked on farms. Remember, in 1920, 2 million accounted for 1 out of every 15. How much do you think uh, 11 and a half million people accounted for the total uh, and, uh, labor force in 1910? It was huge. It was huge. But times change, right? Times change. And I'm not saying we don't still have a big agriculture sector, but a lot of that, if you don't know, has been automated. There's nowhere near as many people working in agriculture as there used to be. Okay. Um, uh, video killed the radio star. Uh, a famous song um, by, uh, oh crap, I can't remember the name of the, the group. Uh, I think they're out of Australia. Uh, but they did a, a song in the 80s called Video Killed the Radio Star. But anyway, here's, uh, you know, uh, 500 different radio programs aired in the early 1900s. And those went by the wayside because some Scottish inventor brought you the TV, right? And it's interesting. There it is. The Bugles. Video killed the radio star. That's the name of the band. The Bugles. All right? So what's really happening here is technology is kind of churning here, right? It's kind of creating quite a bit of uh, disruption. It's rendering some jobs now virtually unnecessary and obsolete. Certainly don't need as many blacksmiths today as we used to. When's the last time you had your horse shoed? Right? So, um, uh, but at the same time, it's also creating new jobs, isn't it? Yeah, the, the, the car displaced your, your blacksmiths, but couldn't some of them be trained to be mechanics? All right? So, there was a, there was a, a it goes both ways. Technology is also creating new jobs. And we're going to be able to show quite convincingly that many more jobs were created than uh, were lost. And, and I, I think we can prove that quite conclusively. You'll see what I mean. So here's another business that's really virtually gone now, right? Um, back in the day, uh, leading up until the uh, late 19th, early 20th century, ice trade was a pretty common practice. Now, obviously, it wouldn't work here in Texas. First off, where are you going to get the ice? By the time you got down here, it'd be melted. Because we didn't have a whole lot of ice in Texas. Um, but up north, this was very common practice. And you can see them here, cutting up big chunks of ice. This is how people would keep food and other items cold in some parts of the, of the country. All right? And the world, I'm sure. All right? But then along come the refrigerator. Um, and really the advent of these consumer products, these of convenience, these sort of kitchen uh, items, really began in the 20s. Um, and this was uh, something that um, people couldn't afford, and this was also the advent of consumer credit, right? So that people would be able to buy them on credit and then pay them off over time. And that accrual of debt is one of the reasons why many people point to the stock market collapse in the late 20s and then the Great Depression that followed. Right? But nonetheless, here we are. We have a kitchen. This one looks to be somewhere in the the 30s or 40s, if I had to guess, maybe in the 50s, it's hard to tell, but you can see that that's what that was. So machines, this, the technology is often cast as the culprit, and people are somehow the victims. And we see that today. We, everybody's talking about how automation is going to displace all these jobs. You know, be careful what you wish for. If you're one of those folks who advocates that, that low-skill, low-wage labor get paid more, that you want to see an increase in the, um, uh, an increase in the, minimum wage. Fair enough, um, but be prepared because you, be careful what you wish for because I promise you the more it costs to hire humans, the less it costs to automate and the jobs that are the easiest to automate are those low skill, low wage jobs. They're easy to automate. The only reason they hadn't is because it was low wage. It didn't cost, it, 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 was, it was more economically efficient to pay somebody uh, seven and a quarter an hour or whatever than it was to um, automate that for however much that would cost. But at $15 an hour, guess what? It becomes a lot cheaper to automate. And we're finding this out, aren't you? When's the last time you've been to a Walmart or any other major big box grocery store or retail store? You don't see these self-checkout uh, lines where you can do it yourself? Uh, how, my little McDonald's here in Podunk Azel, my little suburb of Fort Worth, if you will, northwest corner of Tarrant County. 
Our McDonald's has a kiosk. I don't even need to go up there. I can. I can go up there and talk to the person, but they keep screwing up my order. I, the kiosk gets it right every time. So uh, I use I frequently use that kiosk. You're, you're, you're creating an incentive in the economic environment to make automating those jobs much more attractive. So just be careful. You, you be careful what you wish for. You may be uh, pricing yourselves right out of the market. I apologize. I just realized my microphone wasn't right here in front of me, so I may be getting a little louder. You may have to turn this back down. So just FYI. All right. Um, yeah. So sometimes technology is is is, is seen as the enemy uh, as we continue to to march towards increasing automation, but we haven't really ran into that big of a problem yet. I don't think. Some people sure have, um, but it's not the only role. Consumer tastes are a huge part of this, right? Capitalism is about pleasing the customer. There's a, there's an old expression, um, supply creates its own demand. That comes from something called Say's Law, S-A-Y apostrophe S, -A, -Y -S uh, a French economist by the name of Jean-Baptiste Say. But that's really not what he said. <laughs> Say didn't say that. Uh, but nonetheless, this has become a common refrain among some uh, out there that supply creates its own demand. That's just simply untrue. If you don't supply stuff people want to buy, they're not going to buy it. Right? Capitalism is about pleasing the customer, making sure that the customer is getting what they want. And the more people there are competing to do that, the better everybody is. The better everybody is. Let's look at computers, right? And you can see the advance of computers. So we went to mainframes peaked in 1973. Many computers peaked in the mid to late 80s. Uh, mid, excuse me, microcomputers peaked in 1994. All right? But this, this creation of this new technology, it destroys old, old jobs. All right? So you can see here that in 1970, nobody had a home computer. Nobody. All right? Um, uh, but you can also see that uh, uh, by 2000, half of ever, all homes had a computer in them. In the span of three decades, we went from zero market saturation to over half the market. That's the spread. That's the uh, spread of technology, right? Computer programmers numbered barely half a million. Uh, 30 years later, there were more than two and a half million. And I think that's on the low side approximation software company sales a billion dollars 30 years later that increased 140 times over 141 times to be precise uh, internet hosts went from 13 in 1970 i don't know what the heck they called an internet back then to 56 million when i was in the army in the mid to late 80s in colorado fort carson colorado um, we would use uh, a friend of mine taught me how to use a modem and we would dial into bulletin board systems. And you would take the old phone that sat on a cradle, and you would have to put it in this. The modem then was a, you put the, the phone in it, on it. And it would sit inside there, and it would, you could dial up a, a bulletin board system. It's called a BBS. And that's how, that was what passed for the internet at that time. Um, and I remember thinking, this is going to be a big deal. This is going to get bigger. Sooner or later, we're going to be buying cars online. And that's what we, one of the things you could do is go to these bulletin board systems where car lots would be a, talking about the cars that were coming out and stuff. It was interesting. Played a lot of games on there. Mostly text-based adventure stuff. But nonetheless, you can see the, the growth in this, right? And then, of course, the, the last time you've seen the Encyclopedia Britannica may have been in your local library. That's the best you got right there. But back uh, not so long ago, this was very common practice. Today, it's you just... Go to the internet. Google has really supplanted uh, that. And as I have other search engines, better search engines, if you ask me, but that's personal preference. All right. So between 1990 and 1995, as this explosion in technology, what happened was you had two, and I've, I've said this before, two paradigm shifting technologies in their own rights merged. Communication. Computers, they came together to form this internet, and this was this was in the early stages where everybody could see this coming. And despite that, they were cutting jobs, almost a million of them between 1990 and 1995, cutting jobs, not adding people, reducing. Kodak just fell off the map, right? Mainly because our, we have 
phones that do it now. I mean, my, this is a really good camera, right? To me, pretty good. I printed pictures and prints from this at the kiosk down at CVS or something similar to that, right? But you can see the job picture at, at Kodak and how it shrinks, right? We call this creative destruction, which is a term that, to my knowledge, it was a, it's attributed to a man by the name of, I think it's Arthur Schumpeter or something like that, Schumpeter. I think he's Aust Austrian. Um, but I think he really got it from, to be frank, uh, Karl Marx. Um, it's this idea that free market economies continue to adapt, continue to progress, continue to create new technology, and in so doing, displaces old jobs, but creates new ones in their place. And in fact, uh, you can see here, um, railroad employees from 2 million in 1920 to 111,000 20 years ago. That's a, that's a huge collapse in that particular uh, employer. Right? There are no carriage and harness makers. There are no telegraph operators or boiler makers. Right? Anybody know what a cobbler is? It's not someone who makes peach gobbler. Right? They fix shoes. They fix shoes. Back then, you kind of needed someone to fix your shoes because you just couldn't go down to the local Payless or Walmart and buy you a new pair like you can today. All right? Watchmakers. We don't really have watchmakers anymore. You just go buy you a new watch. They're digitized. They're pretty cheap and inexpensive unless you want a, a high-end one. All right? Um, so let's see. Farm workers went from almost 12 million, 11 and a half million to less than three quarters of a million uh, in the span of 90 years. All right? Secretaries, you know, we lost some, but still. Computers played a huge role in that. We didn't need typing pools anymore. One person with a computer was as efficient as 10 or 15 uh, uh, typists in the pool. So it worked out. All right? But they didn't have, in, in, in 1900, they didn't have any airline pilots or mechanics. Today, quarter of a million. 20 years ago, today it's even more. And the demand for that is huge, right? Um, they didn't have auto mechanics. They do today. Engineers went from 38,000 turn of last century to over 2 million turn of this most recent century. That's a huge jump. And you can see there's a number of different jobs that really increased. In fact... If you, if you crunch the numbers and start doing the math, you find out that over the, over the period, of, over, what is that, about a 30-year period from 1979 to 2007, about 29 years, um, for every three jobs that we lost to creative destruction, we gained four jobs. And I think, again, I'm going to be able to show that that's got to be a true statement. And maybe even faster than that. At one point, I bet it was faster. I bet that I bet that has decelerated um, as we've adapted new technology and the and the growth of technology has seemed to slow. That's not really what's happening, but it seems to. Certainly, in the realm of of human productivity, uh, you could argue that it has. But there's other things that um, uh, and other technologies that maybe aren't uh, benefiting uh, production and therefore uh, human productivity, but are still developing and moving forward. Um, nonetheless, um, uh, I would, I would argue that that had to have happened even faster prior to 1979. And here's why I say that we'll get there in just a moment. So be patient. All right. So again, free market economies destroy jobs to be sure, but they create new ones. Um, and in that process, productivity rises. We get more from every one of us and thus there's more for each of us, right? Uh, we are clearly better off on average for enduring this churn of capitalism, right? Um, so 2015, there's been 197 billion emails sent per day globally on average. That was seven years ago. I'm sure it's even much, much greater today um, as these phones have really just consumed our, our worlds in the last decade or plus. All right, so generally speaking, you know, you get the general flow of this. You can pause that if you're interested in, in, in going through that a little bit more. Again, you can see where the unemployment falls uh, and where new jobs are being created. We've talked about that. It's also interesting to point out that in, say, 1790, right, which seems like a long time ago, but you got to keep it in perspective, folks. Of course, it was a long time ago. What's that's, you know, uh, 232 years ago, three, 
233 years ago. So of course that's a long time ago. But in the in the expanse of human history, it's not. 300 years is a drop in the bucket. Um, human beings have been around for thousands of years. Um, but in 1790, the overwhelming majority of your expenses went to food. Right? It went to the basic staples, the necessities. You had to eat. More than anything else, you had to eat. Today, barely 1% of what we, of what we spend on average is just for, some, you know, eating. All right. So this creative destruction has led to a, a rising living standard. We have more goods and services. We have shorter work weeks. We have better jobs. There are a greater variety and, and newer goods. Uh, things are are safer and more secure than they've ever been. Um, uh, so it's interesting. Creative destruction has really freed us to, you know, it wasn't until what, the early part of last century that I think we really started to take a hard look at how society was working and determined that we weren't too happy about this. Uh, that's when women got the right to work, the right to vote. That's when um, child labor laws began to get implemented. Um, you know, there were just a lot of different changes. Um, you know, over the last century, that's when we started getting rid of um, a lot of, uh, you know, Jim Crow laws and things of that nature. We've really made, tried to, arguably uh, not as much progress as some would like, more than perhaps others would want to admit. But nonetheless, we have made some progress in some pretty significant areas. And I think it's in large part because it frees us up. Capitalism and this creative destruction has freed us from the day-to-day -day grind of just trying to survive. And now we can sit around going, hmm, I wonder how I can make the world a better place. That was not something they had the they, they, they could really ponder too heavily 200 years ago. Surely you can appreciate that, right? It was not that easy. This, this sort of uh, historic relativism that we employ to judge people in the past for the things they did, um, it's a little silly to me um, because uh, completely different time. And back then that was the norm. That was how everybody and everything acted. It not doing those things would have been, would have been much weirder and stranger and probably uh, led to you not being uh, 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 able to, 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 do, to do much for yourself or for your family. Again, email me if you think I'm wrong. And remember, if you don't want me to know that it's you that's criticizing me uh, because of the way I do in class, feel free to set up a, a generic Yahoo or Hotmail account. You suck at Yahoo.com. It's fine with me. I just want your feedback if you have issues with me. I don't want you harboring that as a resentment throughout the semester. That's just going to hurt you. So pass it on to me. Maybe I can help and resolve it. Maybe not. But give it a shot. All right. Uh, nonetheless, uh, let's move on. All right, here's an interesting part. This is showing, you know, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different time periods and listing the most valuable companies. And there's one company that is in every single column, AT&T, right? Uh, American uh, Telegraph and Telephone or Telephone and Telegraph, something like that. Um, interesting to me. That is interesting to me. They were second, and then first, and then second, and then fourth, and then they dropped all the way down to 20th before bouncing back up to fifth. And now they're back down to around 18, and they're probably still not too far from that. Probably, arguably still in the top 20, although maybe, I don't know, Facebook or Twitter has joined them. I don't know, some social media uh, may be in there. Who knows? But nonetheless, maybe Amazon. Um, is Amazon in that top 20? Sure, they are. I don't see. There's Facebook, though. Do I see Amazon? I don't see it in the top 20 on, in, in 2016. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, so this is kind of interesting that AT&T, this company that started 100 plus years ago, has been able to continue to reinvent themselves and adapt to this ever-changing uh, uh, technological landscape, if you will, um, to continue to thrive as an organization. Um, going through periods, I'm sure, that were not easy, but overall... A lot of companies do not survive this. I'll give you a good example. Does anybody remember who the were the first ones that come up with this this mobile computing device here? Does anybody remember the BlackBerry? Whatever happened to the company that made Blackberries? 
they think about this. They started out, correct me if I'm wrong, with like a hundred percent of the market share. And I think they're still aren't that out there. I think the name of the company is RTI or something like that. But now their market share is tiny, 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 tiny. They were not prepared. Uh, in this in this kind of uh, world, you better be nimble and quick and be able to, to change like the wind because um, it's it's coming and it, it happens fast and you better be incredibly insightful. Um, it's not an easy thing. All right. So sometimes you can argue that business failing, a microeconomic failure, is not the same thing as a macro failure. Sometimes it means the society that the economy is succeeding, right? It's transferring resources from less efficient providers to more efficient providers. And that's not nothing. That's what we want. Because, I'm sorry, contrary to what some may believe, human beings are terrible at predicting where we need to put these. Some are better than others, to be sure. Maybe we need to get the CEOs of AT&T to run our government, then, then we can argue. Um, but certainly I'm not, I haven't been impressed with politicians to do it by any stretch. Anywhere in the world, not just here. All right. Again, Kodak just collapsed. I did a, we did a, a, a thing, a, a business thing on them when I was in business school. Uh, my master's degree in economics was actually a dual master's initially, MBA and economics. I transitioned to just economics when I hadn't graduated and then moved on to the doctoral program in another area. But um, before I did, I had to take a marketing class for my MBA and a graduate marketing class. And one of the things we did was a, a project on Kodak. And it was bleak. It was tough. Brutal. Brutal. This complete. If you don't know, Kodak made cameras and film and stuff like that. Very commonplace. When I grew up, that's what we got. Get the film, load it in the camera, take pictures, then go take it delivered. And we, you couldn't see what the picture turned out to sometimes for weeks or months. Um, but today, boom, it's right there on your phone immediately. And they just chewed Kodak up. They just chewed Kodak, plum up, gone, right? 1970 mar uh, uh, market capitalization, most of it was manufacturing. Today, most of it is high tech, right? Telecommunications is taking on a bigger role. Um, that's in part you know, the internet. And this was in 2000. Now, 22 years further along than uh, uh, from that, it's probably even more. I would, sus I would suspect that high tech has taken on an even bigger role. Telecommunications has taken on a bigger role. We're much more service oriented. So maybe some of these other areas have grown too. So everything is subject to this, this creative destruction. Uh, the products we consume, the jobs we have, companies where we work, the, the, our investments, um, even, even the, the, the human capital your employer might want you to, to have, the, the skills, the talents, the knowledge, even that can be subject to this kind of change. And you can see some of that again here. All right. Um, so typically, uh, job loss is seen as, uh oh, there's, there's something wrong with me. And then we externalize it and say there's something wrong with the company or maybe something wrong with the economy. And in fact, there's really nothing wrong. Uh, somebody somewhere is doing something right. Okay. And this anti-technology stuff, and some of you may even agree with it. You're, you're not original by any stretch. This dates back to the Luddites of, of 19th century England. They would go into these textile, uh, plants and destroy these sort of water powered looms because they were taking our jobs, right? We needed that work. And so they would go and destroy those. So all of those products cost somebody a job. Somebody's job is no long, no longer even exists because we have smoke alarms, need fewer firefighters. We have more safer cars, right? Um, smaller computers. We don't need desktops. I have an old desktop down here. My son's always asking. He's just enamored with that thing. Can't believe that, that that's a computer. It didn't work, but it's there. Um, creative destruction is a, is a real thing. It is a, it is a, 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 the primary force that delivers progress in a free market system. Um, it's hastened by technology, um, but ultimately consumers decide the direction that this is going to go, how it's going to get used and to make what, right? Um, and so job loss is not the result of a failure. It's the result of progress, right? Companies need uh, for talent and skill of their workers. That evolves as progress changes, right? All right. Now let's move on to this idea of standard of living. Now that we've established that maybe, you know, there's something driving here. There's a there's a force behind all this that I'm about to talk about. And that was the main point of that, that first half hour. My apologies if that seemed unnecessary, but I assure you it is not. So 
how do we benefit from this churn? Again, cost of living has fallen dramatically. Let me tell you what I mean. So, for example, we typically measure productivity as output per hour of work. But if we take the inverse of that, we get how much a, a product costs in terms of how many hours you have to work to make it, to make enough money to buy it, I mean. All right? So we call that the work hour cost of a product. Couldn't you argue that that's the real pro real price of a product, right? Uh, Adam Smith, author of Wealth of Nations, uh, 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 that, that Scottish philosopher I mentioned, arguably the godfather of economics, wrote Wealth of Nations, published in 1776. Scottish philosopher said, The price of everything is the toil and trouble of acquiring it. What is bought with money is purchased by labor. Henry David Thoreau said, The cost of a thing is the amount of life which is required to be exchanged for it. Right? So let's take a look at an example of what I'm talking about here, right? So here is the, here's a color TV in 1971, the Sony Trinitron, all right? It cost $620 in 1971. The average hourly wage at that, in that same time was $3.57 an hour, all right? So the average worker would need to work 174 hours to have enough money to buy that TV. See how we're talking now? Now, is is the average hourly wage accurate? I don't know, but if every year we calculate it, we calculate it the same way, for purposes of comparison, it does not matter whether it is accurate. As long as we did it the same way every single time, then when we compare them, we're, we're looking at apples and apples. And that's what we want. If you disagree or find some flaw in this, let me know. Bear with me. All right. So, uh, beef prices and money and time. Not too worried about that. Three pound chicken. You can see that um, the... Uh, uh, Price in dollars has just collapsed over time, whereas the amount of time working, um, or price in dollars has technically gone up, but in real, in a real way, uh, the amount of time necessary to accrue enough money to buy a, a three-pound chicken or beef has completely collapsed. And you'll see this. Let's look at homes. This is the arguably the single largest consumer expense there is. In 1920. Um, this home would have been worth about $4,700. That comes out to about 7.8 hours per square foot. The average worker in 1920 would need to work 7.8 hours, almost 8 hours, per square foot. By 1956, that number had fallen to 6.5 hours per square foot. By 2003, under 6 hours per square foot. By 2014, we're talking about $5.2 uh, Sorry, 5.2 hours per square foot. All right, and it's important to point out here that the homes from 1920, 1950, 1970s went on are not the same homes that we have today. Today we have garages, we have central heat and air, we have multiple bedrooms, multiple stories, insulation. Right? I bought this house virtually brand new. Right? Um, it had been built in December 2017. It was completed. Um, somebody bought it, and moved in. Barely three months later, they accepted a job in San Antonio, put it right back on the market, and we happened to be looking and stumbled across this uh, this nice house. Um, so we got it. It was still under warranty from the home builder. They give a 12-month warranty. It was still under warranty from the home builder. That's how new this house was. So anyway, um, it, it came with a dishwasher. It came with an oven and a microwave, um, garbage disposable, garage door opener with two controls for each of our cars. I mean, it was, it's pretty amazing. Um, the houses today are much more uh, advanced than they were uh, certainly 50, 60, 70 years ago. Um, much more efficient, much more effective, and less expensive in terms of how much you had to work in order to make enough money to afford a home. Now, there are other factors to be sure, right? Um, it's not it's not necessarily easy as easy as some would like it to buy a house, but quite frankly, you're asking people to give you a quarter unless you have the money yourself to buy it outright. You're asking somebody else to give you hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy a house. That's not 
something that should be all that easy to, to, to have done. It should be a little tough because um, that's a lot of money you're asking somebody else to risk for you. All right. So remember what we talked about in the turn of the century, right, where almost everything you spent went to, went to food, right? So, for example, here's another way of breaking this down. Almost 41% of the household budget uh, was spent on food at the turn of the last century, century before last, I guess you would say, but in 1901, right? 12% uh, on clothing, 22 to 23% on shelter. In other words, three quarters of all the money that was accrued by a person alive back then had to be spent on these three basic necessities, food, shelter, clothing. That was it. Today, that has fallen to less than a third. From three quarters of your budget to less than a third of your budget is now spent on those on those three necessities of life. We take this stuff for granted. Look at the cost of an electric range, right? That was a three burner stove. In 1910, you'd have to work 345 hours to earn, uh, to make enough money to buy that thing. By 2015, 10 hours. And these ovens are a lot better today, right? Here's a refrigerator in 1916, right? Um, you had to work over 3,000 hours for that. Today, it's less than 40 hours. 1911, this is supposed to be a, uh, a clothes, a, a clothes washer, a washing machine. I don't know if I would trust my delicates in there, but you know, some overalls might be good for that thing. 1911, over 550 hours necessary to work to make them enough money for that. Today, it's 13. And it's a much better machine. Here again, the technology has evolved and gotten much better, much, much better. Right? In 1940, here's an electric dryer. You had to work almost 200 hours to make enough money for that. Today, it's 11. Here, this is supposed to be a dishwasher. I question that. I wouldn't trust Granny's fine china in that thing. It looks a little prehistoric. It looks downright, it looks like some sort of torture contraption. All right? Probably get somebody to confess having to do their dishes in that thing. But in 1913, you had to spend, a, you had to work for 463 hours to earn enough money to make that, to buy that. 2015, 12 hours. TV, we talked about this earlier with that 1971 Sony Trinitron. There it is again. But in 1954, that box right there, 562 hours. Today, 12. A car, another good example. You had to work almost 4,700 hours in 1908 to earn enough money to buy that car. By 1955, it had fallen to over uh, to just over 1,600 uh, hours. By 2015, down to almost 1,200 hours. And here again, the cars that you're buying are 10 times better than the ones you were buying back then, right? Um, just power steering alone. And anybody who's ever driven a car that did not have power steering knows what I'm talking about. It, drain out your power steering fluid and see how your car, see how fun it is to turn your car. Right? Tinted glass, uh, security systems, anti-lock, uh, um, Power windows, power seats, sunroofs, airbags in every orifice of your car these days. Navigation systems. I just bought a, a new Kia Nero. Uh, it's a, a, I think I mentioned this, it's a self-charging hybrid. Um, so uh, I get about 50 miles to the gallon with that thing. Uh, and it holds about, you know, I get about 500, almost 500 miles on a tank of gas. Uh, but it's self-charging. I never have to plug it up plug it in it just it takes care of it itself i recommend it but it's got a nice sunroof it's got a navigation system it's a pretty good it's a pretty good thing it's a pretty good deal right um just the just the sheer volume of improvements um power steering tinted glass uh side view mirrors air conditioning oh my god can you imagine texas anybody ever driven in a car ridden in a car that didn't have uh, uh air conditioning uh, in the summer or heat in the winter it's miserable it's miserable. Your body just sticks to the seat as you melt into it, right? Not not the case if you if with with these, most of these modern cars, they they work pretty good. Look at a microwave oven. That thing looks like something that was left over from the Manhattan Project, right? 1947, you had to work almost 2,500 hours to buy one of those. Today, it's like three, right? Now you might remember this in one of your high school classrooms, right? That top loading DVD or top loading VCR player uh, that really needed an upgrade at least 20 years earlier and they never did. Um, 1972, you'd have to work 365 hours for that. Today, you'd work an hour and a half and nobody needs to work an hour and a half for these because we just buy streaming. 
right? Talk, talk again. How much? How much has the streaming services affected the jobs in the VCR or DVD construction plants, right? Where they build those things. How many of you have a DVD player in your own, uh, on your own personal home? When's the last time you watched a DVD, right? For some of you, it's maybe not been that long, but for some of you, it's been a long time because we stream everything: Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime, and now everybody seems to have a streaming service, right? Cameras, 1960, 57 hours. Today, 10. Right? And the cameras are a lot different. They're smaller. They are arguably take much better pictures. Phones. Uh, I had a phone like that. You know, weighed a ton. You had to hold it for two hands with two hands. Uh, but typically, you'd have to work about 464 hours for that thing. Today, it's about an hour, but that's because you pay this out. They fold the cost of the phone into your contract. And so, you know, uh, I, we've got four of these phones. Me, my wife, my son, and uh, a family member. Um, and so they, it costs us like $250 a month, but that's only because we have four of them, right? One of them, it might cost you $60 a month. Um, and how, how many hours do I need to work to make $60 uh, or the, the average worker need to work to make $60 to buy, to pay for that, All right? Coast to coast flight in 1930. I told you about three decades removed from Kitty Hawk and boom, it became fairly standard practice to be flying around the country. Certainly maybe even the world, um, $200 uh, for for a coast to coast flight across the country, 366 hours would be necessary to work to get earn that much. Today it's 78 dollars more expensive, and with inflation, it's a lot more expensive. But you only have to work 12 hours on average. All right? Calculators, computers. My goodness, look at this. This was an early computer, punch card machine. So is that, by the way. They're punch card machines, right? You have to have an entire floor dedicated to having enough processing power. MIT certainly did that. Others did that. Right. This is an early uh, computer. Uh, this is a floppy disk. My very first computer was something called a Commodore VIC-20. It predates the floppy disk. We used cassette tapes it's called a data set, but it's a cassette tape. Right. Um, and then there, there's that. I don't know if you can see, but that, that was the old floppy. That's where it got its name, a floppy disk, because it was literally kind of floppy. And you put it in there. That's an old one. And then they updated, upgraded that one to these smaller three and a quarter inch floppy drive, floppy disks. Um, and then eventually that just went completely away, went to CDs, now DVDs. And now you most, your laptops sometimes don't even have a DVD on it. It's just not, there's no need to put those things in there. All right? So computers are another area where you've just seen rapid growth. And they've gotten increasingly less expensive in terms of how much the average worker needs to work to make enough money to pay for this. All right? And here's a whole bunch of goods, a whole bunch of goods. You put it all together, you're talking about over 60,000 different goods and services that we consume. All right? And again, your cost of living um, in terms of money spent seems much greater. But in terms of how many hours you have to work to make that much money, oh my gosh. It is, it is a, a, a fraction of what it was. A fraction of what it was. Right? Uh, on average. Right? The problem is not that we are, uh, that the cost of living has gone up. It's not the cost of living. It's the cost of living high. <laughs> and I don't mean the way you wish you were. I mean the typical way. Uh, the living with all these advances in technologies, right? Um, consumption per person from 1929 to 2014. That's a, that's a pretty steep climb. Today, um, American consumers consumed double what it was in the 80s when I was a teenager, triple that of the 60s when my parents were uh, um, teenagers. Today, uh, you know, you consume five to six times that of just your great-grandparents, right, from the uh, 40s, 50s, the World War II era, the boomers, from when they were kids, right? And how is this even possible? Man, I'm telling you what. Um, it, it, it's diff again, I'm wanting someone to tell me why I'm wrong. I see evidence like this, and I don't know how I could possibly not conclude that capitalism is extraordinarily efficient and effective. Now, is there a downside to it? Of course there is. Let's not let, let's not let uh, good be the enemy of the perfect, right? Let's accept the reality that nothing humans do will ever be perfect, because humans aren't perfect. Everything we create, every system we create is going to have flaws, going to have shortcomings, naturally. But how do, how, how, what other conclusions can you draw from this? Let me know. All right. 
Um, uh, capitalism has its own built-in welfare transfer system. So have, have you ever done this, right? Have you ever wanted something, but it just came out and it's just too expensive. So you're going to wait until the price comes down, right? But what if everybody's waiting for the price to come down? The reason why the first generation of any new good or service is so much more expensive than future generations of that good or service is because all of the cost associated with developing that good, all of the research, the money spent researching the development of that good has to go in, has to get recovered in that first generation. If you can't recover that, then you can't continue, you can't make enough money to start a second generation, right? You're in, you, you have, for most people, they had to borrow that money in order to get there. And they've got to get that. They've got to be able to make payments on that or they're going to go belly up. So how? If everybody is, most of us are, none of, none of us are uber wealthy, are we? So most of us have to wait until the price comes down. What if everyone waited? I mean, who is it that's buying the good when it first comes out? When it's at its highest price, when it costs the most, who buys that? We're the ones buying it several years later when it's second and third generation. But how do they get to second and third generation if they can't find consumers to buy the more expensive first generation? All those fixed costs associated with bringing a new good to market. All the money spent in research. All the money spent in de development. All the money spent putting that thing together. Who is paying those fixed costs? Who's paying those fixed costs? Right? Think about that. The wealthy are. The people who have the disposable income. In the absence of them, how would we get any new good or service to the market? How would we ever get past that first generation stage? And everything would be more expensive. I don't care for this kind of slide here. The argument is, and it's true, fair enough. The argument is, is that our poverty today isn't near as bad as it used to be. Fair enough. But can we all just agree poverty still sucks? Let's not, let's not, it's a little too cute by half. And quite frankly, I think it's a little condescending and insulting. As someone who was, can I say, chronically, almost pathologically poor for most of my life, uh, back off, buddy. Right? You're right. It's not as bad today. Even in my house growing up, when we didn't have much money at all. And there were, I had five brothers and my mom was single for much of that. You know, I don't, uh, we didn't have microwaves. They weren't invented back then. We had a TV. Sometimes it didn't work. We didn't have cable back then, but we had a few local channels. You had a stove. We had a fridge. I don't know about you. If you know what a swamp cooler is, that was our air conditioning. You had to keep water in it. Sometimes you had to just put the hose in it and leave the water running. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Right? I didn't have VCRs or cell phones. Um, we did have a vehicle. In fact, when I was a baby, <laughs> toddler. Um, they came and repoed my parents' car. That was back when my dad was still with us. I uh, was, was still in the family. And uh, I was in the car when they towed it and took off with me still in it, not realizing I was in it. And my mom and dad went chasing after him and got me out of the car. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so this, these were those were things that happened, right? We had a, a, we, we had a washer. We didn't have a dryer. I remember many times hanging up clothes on a clothesline out in back. Um, certainly no computers until I was a teenager in my 80, in the 80s. Um, th but my youth, my, my childhood was in the 70s, a small town, Brownwood. Um, uh, most, so I've got students in, in this class that are from Brownwood, so y'all know, y'all y'all have an idea of what Brownwood uh, is like now. And it's, it hadn't changed a whole lot in the last 50 years, I can assure you. Uh, but I'm, I'm st it's interesting that we all left Brownwood and now all of my family has moved back except for me and my younger brother. Um, so couldn't have been all that bad. Uh, and you find as you get older that you kind of miss, you, you kind of realize that it may not have been all that terrible. Um, but anyway, didn't have dishwasher back then, you had to do it yourself. Uh, but you did have a freezer to put your food in and the icebox and that kind of thing. It's, it's not, it's not, the, it's not that the cost of living is rising, right? It's not the high cost of living, it's the cost of living high. That is what has, uh, has led to this, right? Arguably. So I want you to tell me where I'm wrong. You tell me what your conclusion is based on the information I just provided you. That's going to be the question that I ask you. Um, 
and you answer it like someone who's watched this video, you'll get full credit for watching the video. You answer it like you have no idea what I'm talking about, and I won't give you any credit for the video. All right, so here comes the question shortly. Um, but uh, until then, folks, until next time, uh, be safe, be kind, uh, handle your work, email me any questions, issues, graphs, complaints, whines, moans, and groans. I'm always available to talk to you. I can't guarantee you I can fix the issue, but I know I can't if I don't know anything about it. Give me a chance to at least work with you. All right. Uh, so let me know. I know there's some issue with grades right now in the in the grade book. I apologize. I'm working with Canvas to resolve that. I promise you I am. I was just with the dean yesterday talking about this very thing, and we're all in a panic. Going, my, I know my students are going to freak out. Sure enough, within hours, I was getting five or ten emails about the problem with grades. And it's specific to lecture quizzes. You're the only class where the Ed Puzzle lecture quizzes are embedded and automatically brought in, and there's something going on there that's not working well, and I need to get with Canvas and maybe even Ranger College, I don't know, to figure out what it is. So I apologize. We will get that worked out. Uh, regardless, thanks, everyone. Appreciate you listening. Took up an hour of your time. All right. Uh, class will typically be about an hour and 20 minutes long, twice a week. So you only get me once and usually less than an hour each time. So I think we're doing pretty good. Uh, anyway, I will talk to you all soon. Uh, again, be safe, be kind. Let me know if you have any questions. Thanks.